I want to begin this morning by uh, telling you a story from uh, when I graduated from high school. When I was in high school, uh, I, my dad wanted me to basically play for the Dodgers is what he wanted me to do. So I played, since I grew up in the desert, we could, we could play ball all year round, and that's what we did. Uh, and so my dad was, you know, the kind of guy that took me out after two or three hour practice uh, and would practice more with me after practice. Uh, that's the kind of life I lived. So I went to college at Azusa Pacific. It was to play baseball. That's why I went. Uh, theology was a secondary thing. Um, so I, I played a lot of baseball. So my, my friends that I grew up with, they all played baseball. So we all played against each other in Little League, uh, well, pee- peewee leagues, and then Little League, and then Pony League, and then Babe Ruth. And eventually we got to the big AAA school, and then we all competed for positions. Uh, and played together. So I knew all those guys very well. Uh, and I think from all of my friends, knowing them for most of my life in the Imperial Valley where I grew up in uh, Southern California, in the desert near Yuma, uh, I think most of my friends on that team, uh, if not all of them, I don't think any of, of them were Christians. Uh, and so I, uh, they knew I was a Christian. My nickname in high school was Father Marty. Uh, the, it's in the yearbook. You can see it because a lot of my friends were Catholic, and that's what they called me. You should be a priest. Um, and so that, I put that in the yearbook because uh, that, that was the nickname. Uh, and, and so I, I spent a lot of my time talking to my friends about, you know, spiritual things. Uh, and I, after four years of talking to my friends uh, on different freshman JV varsity teams, um, I had zero results. Zero. It's kind of shocking because I like to talk uh, uh, and uh, debate and discuss and pursue truth. And I, I you know, I, I just couldn't get any of my friends to, to see the need to trust Christ. They were too busy partying and having a great time. And we had lots of conversations. They would bring them up. I wasn't like obnoxious and like, I've got them on the bus now. It's a two-hour trip and they can't get away. I'm going to totally talk to them, um, get the mic on the bus. I didn't do that kind of stuff, but I was cool. And, but I would talk to them and we would have discussions. Uh, but I couldn't, I couldn't get into the point to trust Christ as Savior. That was, you know, they would never get past that hurdle. Well, I, I graduated in 76 uh, and I went away to Azusa Pacific University in Los Angeles to work on a degree in Old Testament. And then uh, my, one of my friends, uh, on the first baseman, Hubie was his name. Hubert Grabeel was his name. We called him Hubie because all baseball players have nicknames. So we called him Hubie. Uh, and uh, he, he, we, got, we linked up in 1976 in the fall of 76. Uh, he joined the Navy, uh, became, a, I think, a medic, went in the medical corps. Uh, then I uh, w- uh, went to college in L.A. So we were two hours apart. But uh, we started calling each other, talking to each other, and uh, and he, who had no church background whatsoever, uh, is linked up in the Navy. With his roommate is a devout Satanist. <laughs> He's really calling me then. <laughs> what in the world? He's got this Satan, this Bible. What, in, what is he doing in the room? So he had all kinds of questions. You know, so he'd call me in college, and we would talk and discuss. And um, then I got busy with school. I and mean, I was, you know, I had a lot to do. So academically, I kind of forgot about Hubie. Uh, and then... Later on in the semester, I decided I was tired of studying like you do in college, and I decided I need to go home four hours from L.A. to El Centro, driving out across the desert of you know, Palm Springs, Indio, Coachella, where I grew up. And so I, I didn't have a car, so my sister, remember I told you I learned how to drive with the stick shift, the Datsun B210, the ultimate sports car? Uh, that was my dad's work car with U.S. Customs. It was a little white thing. Uh, but my uncle, uh, who was a very wealthy farmer, bought my sister, who was a junior at Azusa Pacific, uh, ahead of me, uh, he bought her a new car. Uh, this is what he bought her. I think I have a picture of it. The ultimate sports car. Yeah, that was the color. Yeah, right. Love those rims. Anyway, um, so I didn't have a car, so I went over. I knocked on Marla's uh, apartment door and uh, said, hey, can I borrow your car for the weekend? Drive home, see mom and dad. She's like, sure. So I jumped in her, her brand new Datsun B210 uh, and took off for El Centro. It's about a four hour drive, got there. My mom said, hey, you know, tonight's Friday night. It's, it's homecoming, why don't you go? I'm like, fantastic, I mean, I, I love see friends and everything. Uh, so I got to the game uh, at Central Union High School and this is the, the field. Uh, and we were the Spartans where we actually had a guy on a horse with a armor on with a sword and the shield. Probably not appropriate today, but back then that's how we rolled. You're looking at me like, glad I didn't go to that high school. Um, but anyway, that was the high school. And, and so I walked onto the field, and I'm on this side of the stands just like that. And I'm walking around looking for friends. I don't see any friends. It's kind of odd going back as a college student. All my friends were graduated. They're gone. So I kind of feel odd. I'm like a visitor. You know, I'm walking around. And, and all of a sudden, I hear somebody yelling my name from the crowd. It's Hubie. He's there on a weekend furlough from the Navy. I happen to be there from college. I go up in the crowd, sit down with Hubie for the game. Old times, had a great time. 
It was just by chance we were sitting there, right? Uh, and after the game, he's like, hey, man, I don't have any wheels. You know, you got wheels? Oh, yeah, man, I got a major car in the parking lot. It's a <laughs> Datsun P210. And so we jumped in the car. It was cold that night in the desert. Drove to Imperial. His town was about six miles. Pulled in the parking lot. We'd done many times before. Dropped him off. But before we got out of the car, he starts asking me theological questions. So I'm like, hey, I'm game. So we began to talk about theology and, and stuff. Uh, and the windows are fogging up. You can't even see outside. Uh, and there in that car, Hubie trusted Christ. It was awesome. Four years. Took four years, and he trusted Christ. Uh, 1996, he called me from LAX out of the clear blue, says, hey, do you know who this is? <laughs> don't recognize the voice. You don't rec No. After a while, you forget your friend's voices. It just happens. <laughs> Talked to him then. Um, he's still going, going g great, guns with God. Uh, Talked to him a few years ago. Uh, he's um, a deacon in his church, serves, teaches, scriptures, etc. Christian wife, Christian kids, great guy. And I'm like, still shocked. That, that in that little car that night, he trusted Christ after all those years and all those conversations. Why in the world did I pursue Hubie for four years? Well, I was motivated because to me, everything's at stake. It's all about the gospel. I mean, if you truly believe in the gospel of Christ, this is what you talk about. I mean, it is what, it, it's what drives you. From the minute I got saved in 1967, when I was nine years old, it, it has driven me since. I mean, it is what you think about because eternity hangs in the balance. And so I, I want all those around me to know the power of the gospel of Christ for their own life to transform. Paul was of the same nature. He was constantly going around the world, motivated passionately to share the gospel. And when you read his letter to the Romans, which we've been doing for several weeks, uh, we, we get to this verse. This verse is like a, verse 16 is like a hinge on a door. The whole thing's going to pivot here, uh, rhetorically speaking. He's going to go from giving you his uh, uh, apostolic credentials and things in the opening verses and uh, some of his background as to why he wants to come to Rome. Now he's going to give you some of the, the major reasons of what motivates him, what drives him. If he comes to your church as a speaker, what drives him? It's going to be the gospel that's going to drive him. It's going to lead to a uh, a question that we'll pose this morning is, what are the reasons to be motivated to share the gospel? Well, I can tell you what mine were when I was in high school and beyond. Paul's going to share you some of his motivations, why. And he's going to do it with a series of, uh, according to conjunctions, uh, four of them in number, uh, denoted by the Greek word gar, uh, to tell you that his reasons are clear as to why he's going to write the book of Romans. His reasons will become my reasons, which should become your reasons, why you should be motivated to share the gospel. So we're going to look at those. And now, bear in mind, um, we're going to only look at one verse this morning. I know it's shocking. That's all we're going to do. One verse, zero in on it. But then next week, is we start our Christmas series, because you know Christmas is coming. So we'll have four Christmas messages. So we'll get to verse 17 in January, all right? I'm just trying to help you. So if you want an assignment during Christmas, just read verse 17, and you're good. I want to show you the text of the day we want to study and kind of get a little bit ahead in our reading. But notice the word for is uh, highlighted. Uh, that is the, the Greek word. I took six years of Greek, by the way, in case you don't know me. I was getting my master's in Greek, and then I switched and got it in Hebrew. But uh, I, I liked Greek as well uh, and still do, still read it. Uh, so when you look at this particular text, uh, the word for uh, is the coordinating conjunction that appears at the beginning of each, each of these clauses, which gives us in this particular reading three causal clauses or the reason why the main idea that was introduced in the previous verses is now brought into view here. Uh, you, there's actually four gar, that's gar in Greek. There's four causal clauses. The, the next one's verse 18, if you read ahead, uh, where Paul says, um, in, in verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. We're going to spend quite a bit of time on that verse because men know there's a God and suppress the information with unrighteous means. And we'll talk about that in detail. That's your fourth causal clause. But there's three that we want to just introduce you to here, here in this particular passage. And we only want to talk about the first two this morning. Two reasons why you should be motivated to share the gospel. Notice what he says. He says to the Roman church, for I, Paul, am not ashamed of what? The gospel. First clause, first reason. And then the next thing he says, well, why am I not ashamed of it? Well, the second reason is the power of God into salvation. We want to look at that in order. The reasons to be motivated to share the gospel. And you must ask yourself, am I motivated? Am I motivated? Or am I ashamed of sharing the gospel? Because if you're ashamed to share the gospel, you, there's only two options. If you're ashamed about the gospel... Two, two options. You either are not a Christian, so obviously you'd be shamed by the gospel. You are a Christian, you're either a baby Christian, or you are a carnal Christian, and you need to come to the terms with why that gospel should be showcased, and we'll talk about that this morning. Number, 
Number one, first reason to be motivated by the gospel is the gospel is what we would say in the first clause, it's preeminent. It's preeminent. Paul says, for there is no partiality with God in chapter two. Now what you will notice uh, in this text, and I put the Greek up here because some of our uh, uh, church are taking uh, Greek at Dallas Seminary's campus in Manassas. So if you take the Greek text of this, uh, there is no partiality. You see this, ugar, this means no for. So no for is, is how you read it in Greek. Easy, huh? Um, yeah, it makes total sense. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but this ugar thing is uh, for, uh, it, it's no for. This is totally emphatic. When you read this in Greek, it's totally emphatic. Uh, Paul is totally emphatic in this text as he is in our text before us. He's going to tell you there is no way these certain things are true. See, for Paul, there's, there's belief and there's truth. And there's a vast difference between the two because belief can change. I mean, just remember how they used to view the earth. They originally thought, because they put dragons at the end of the maps, why? Well, <laughs> you sail past this point and you fall off because it's flat. Was the earth flat or was it not? No. The belief was this, but it didn't change the truth. Truth never changes. So Paul says when it comes to spiritual truth, you might have certain beliefs about it, but he says, since I've seen the risen Savior, I know it's definitive. So he uses this ugar formation throughout his book to make definitive statements, which grammatically means, how definitive is my faith? I mean, am I definitive where I draw the line in the sand and say, this is truth, that's false? I mean, it's black and white? Because that's what Paul does. That's the first illustration of how he uses that ugar for no um, statement emphatically. He says, for there's no partiality with God. So when you stand before God in judgment, does he care about how much money you have in the bank? No. Does he care where you went to school? Hey, I went to Harvard, God. Be easy on me. No. Does he care? I, 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 Lord, I was a two-star general. No, it doesn't matter. Uh, doesn't, none of that matters to God. No partiality means, <laughs> no partiality. It's not a trick question. He didn't care. See, this is why when you come before God, you come before him and go, hey, Lord, I, on, on earth I was an attorney. I plea bargained lots of cases. Can I plea bargain here? No. No partiality. True justice. This is an emphatic statement when it comes from God. Uh, here's another Ugar, uh, for there is no way statement that he says in the book of Romans. I'll show you another one. This one's really emphatic. For he is not, you see the Ugar thing? No for, there's no way. Uh, for he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, neither is, uh, is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. Now, if this is a major emphatic statement. Uh, Paul's ethnicity is Jew. What did he just say? If you were a Jew in Rome reading this in his opening part of his letter, is this, is this problematic to you? Yeah, because what did he just say? If you were born in, in the Jewish line, you're Jewish. That's Paul, and Paul's coming along and saying, well, you're not a Jew if you're one just outwardly, you know, you know, by circumcision, etc. No, you got to be one inwardly. What are you talking about? Talk about a definitive statement. Now, does this mean that Paul is thinking that God's done with the Jewish people? No, because when you get to chapter nine, we'll get there eventually, chapter nine, 10, and 11, he's going to ask the question, is God finished with Israel? And his answer is going to be in Greek, me genoito, no way. The strongest way to say no way in Greek. They did use 60s language in the Greek text. I'm just saying. <laughs> Paul's definitive. It's all throughout his writings. He's definitive. You've got to ask yourself, are you definitive? Because when you're definitive, well, that could bother people because you're definitive. Paul was definitive when it came to spiritual truth. He says, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel. This is a, a, an, an, infinite, an emphatic statement. Now notice what he does not say. For I'm, I am not ashamed of the gospel. What's the word before gospel? The, classified grammatically as, it's an article. Okay, so if you remove the article, you have what? Well, it's indefinite then. If it's indefinite, then what word do I supply in the text? A, a gospel. Why did the Holy Spirit anoint Paul to say the gospel? Well, I went through my Greek text this week and went through every reference where the word gospel appears. Guess which word is put before it? Almost without exception. I counted all of them. That's what I get paid to do. The gospel, there's only one. See, if it's, if, it's, if it's indefinite, then it leaves the room open for, well, it could be any gospel. They got their gospel, we got our gospel, they got their gospel, they got, even though they're all diametrically opposed and they all believe that there is this truth, just let them go. They're all going to the same place anyway. They all believe in the same God. Do they? No. 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 
law of non-contradiction tell you you can't have two things, A and B, true at the same time that are, true, that are diametrically opposed to each other. So Paul says, it's the gospel I'm not ashamed about. It's definitive. So when you take Greek, they teach you how to classify articles. The. And you're just thinking, I just thought it was the. Well, in Greek, there's many ways to classify it. I'll give you two options. You have, it's either the monadic use of the article or the par excellence use of the article. Pick either one you can defend grammatically. If it's monadic, monadic use of the article, is it's the one and only. There's no other one like this. Men, are you married? Men, are you married? Is Marty's throwing me a slider right now. What is he talking about? How am I going to hit that thing? You know? uh, uh, what's he doing? Okay, you're married? Okay. Your wife is the one, right? Okay, I'm going to ask it. I'm trying to help your marriage right now. Post. Uh, your wife is the one, right? Yeah, yeah. You're going home. It's going to be good. Uh, she's the one. You can tell her I married you because you are the monadic use of the article. Yeah, right. Now, if you, you want to go with the other use of the article, it's the par excellence use of the article. It is... There's no one more excellent than her, right? You know what I'm saying? Now my, wife, my wife was here in the last service, and you know, I was in college in L.A. Uh, my dad transfers to the federal building in San Diego to be the district director for U.S. Customs. He goes there. He calls me in L.A. Hey, son, come home. You know, you know it's a summer of 79. You're coming home. You come down here. Don't work in L.A. this year. Uh, you know, there's two girls next door, two twins. Boy, are they cute. You need to come home. Number one, you don't let your dad pick your girlfriends. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then... And then I told him, hey, Dad, it's a five-to-one girl-guy ratio at, at Azusa. Why would I want to come to San Diego? He goes, I'm just serious. Summer 79, I did. Four months later, I was engaged, then got married. <laughs> and I've been married 37 years because she is the one. What are my two options? Monadic use of the article. And what's the other one? Par excellence use of the article. What's that got to do with the gospel? There's no other one like it. Pick a religion. No matter how nice the people are, how well-dressed they are, how meaningful they are, how much they care for this, for that, if it is not this gospel, it's a gospel. It's the false gospel. Whoa. Definitive. Paul says it, it, it's a line in the sand. Now, you might ask yourself, like, well, what gospel? He says it's the gospel. Like, when are, you, when are you talking about, Paul? Well, Paul talks about the gospel in 1 Corinthians 15, which chronologically was written in 57 AD. And you're freaking out because it's like, I came to church to relax. This, guy, <laughs> this guy's talking about grammar? Now we're talking about time and history and chronology? Absolutely. First Corinthians, just take it in for just a minute. First Corinthians chapter 15, written around 57 AD, written before the book of Romans. Notice what Paul says, writing to the Corinthians, and he uses this word, euagelion, that's the gospel, evangelize. You know, it's like the gospel, it's the good news. So he says, now I make known unto you, brethren, what? The, with the article the, what are your two options? You're so quiet. We take tests at our church, monadic or par excellence use of the article, which I preached to you, which you also received, uh, in, in which you now stand, by which you are also saved, uh, if you hold fast to the word which I preached to you, unless you believed in vain, which is not going to happen. Verse 3, for I delivered to you as, as a first importance, which I, Paul, also received. What did you receive, Paul? Well, he says, let, let me give you the creedal formula that I, was, I received when I got saved. Here's the creedal formula. That Christ, What? Died, you got a pen? Do you have a pen? You're so quiet. Circle died in your Bible. I'm just saying, I'll give you permission. If God gets mad at you, just tell, blame me. Uh, he died for our sins according to the scriptures. That's prophesied, which is a whole other sermon. It's statistically impossible for one man to fulfill all he did. But anyway. Uh, and that he was buried, second verb, circle that. And that he was raised, third verb, circle that. On the third day, according to the scriptures, that's prophesied, and he appeared, fourth verb, circle that, to Cephas, who's that? Peter. We play Bible trivia during sermons. Uh, Peter. Uh, then to the 12, and then he appeared to me, to, to more than 500 brethren at one time. Wow. That's unbelievable. Most of whom remain until now. So if he says you have a problem not believing in the resurrection, we, you go interview 500 people who saw him. It says, but some of them have fallen asleep, which is a euphemism, uh, figure of speech, for death. Uh, and so he said these Christians have died. Uh, then he appeared to James. Who's James? The brother of Jesus. <laughs> and we talked about this last week. We'll just review because review is a wonderful thing. If your brother told you that he was God, you would do what? What would, what would you do? If your brother said he's God, you would laugh in his face. You know, I'm sure when Jesus told James, I'm, I'm your older brother, and yes, I'm God, I'm sure James went, mm-hmm. Uh -huh. 
We don't have phones yet, but I got people you need to talk to. But he appeared to James after he was crucified and resurrected to James. And his brother, a devout Jew, became a devout believer. What could convert him? He saw the risen Christ, his brother, and he believed. Bodily resurrection. Then he said he appeared to all the apostles. And last of all, as it were, to one untimely born, he, the risen Messiah, well, he appeared to me also. For I am the least of the apostles, who I am not fit to be called an apostle. And then he gives you a causal clause. Why? Well, because I, Paul, hunted down Christians. I killed them. I was so in love with Judaism. I so thought it was the gospel. I pursued them until, well, I ran into the risen Missioch, the Messiah, on the road to Damascus, and I knew he was alive and had defeated sin and death. Now I worship him, and I'm all about his gospel. Now, the book of 1 Corinthians was written in what year? 57 A.D. Now, keep this in mind. According to Dr. Harold Honer, uh, who taught me uh, Greek at uh, Dallas, uh, he wrote his dissertation, I think it was at Cambridge, on the chronological aspects of the life of Christ. It's the definitive work on the chronology of Christ's life. Uh, He validates, and I think he's right, based on his estimation of data, that Christ died on Friday, April the 3rd, 33 A.D. When was Corinthians written? 57 A.D. Jesus died on Friday the 3rd, 33 A.D. How many years is that? How many? I know there's a ton of mathematicians here. You're thinking, well, I don't want to solve a simple problem like that. Well, how many years is that? 33 to 57? 24 years? Okay, is that enough time for a myth to develop? No, no, it's not. Because if you study the writings of Herodotus, uh, it's estimated based on scholastic fields, it takes 80 to 100 years for myth to develop. But all the Gospels were written uh, in the first century, before the close of the first century. They're all written. I mean, all the New Testament was written. So if 1 Corinthians was written in 57 AD, when all scholars, even secular, uh, even like antagonistic scholars will agree to that based on the evidences of the text, and Jesus was crucified on April the 3rd, Paul's telling you, when I got saved, it was right after Jesus died in 33, and then he says in Galatians chapter 1, if you go read chapter 1 verses 18 and following, when I got saved, he says, I went to Arabia for three years, then I went back to Jerusalem, and I ran into Peter. And I hung out with him, I think, for 15 days. 33 AD plus three years is 36 AD is not far from 57 AD. And Paul had this creedal formula of the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and the appearances of Christ to eyewitnesses that anybody could interview. Three years after the death of Christ, they'd already come up with this historical creed based on the evidence that anyone could investigate to be true or not true. And if the Jews wanted to actually deal with the fact that Christ had not really risen, all they had to do was produce the body but they never did. Why? Well, because he was quite risen. Paul says, my belief is based on ancient belief, based on facts, because I saw the Lord. What's the gospel? Well, you underline the verbs. What What do the verbs tell you? The gospel is Jesus died, as prophesied. He was buried, as prophesied. He was raised, as prophesied. And he appeared to people to verify the fact that he was quite alive in a bodily form. I mean, he even cooked the disciples breakfast. I mean, when you go to Israel with me in 2019, if you're going, we go to the place on the North Shore near this uh, Capernaum uh, where Christ preached. We go there and, and study the scriptures there on the seashore where Christ cooked the breakfast uh, for the disciples. Imagine, unbelievable. You know, Paul says, I am, I am not ashamed of that gospel. It's the gospel, that, it, it saved me, it saved me. So if you read Paul in the book of Acts, wherever he went, they didn't like what he had to say because he used to be, well, key student of Gamaliel, one of the greatest rabbinical scholars of all time, and he becomes a believer? Acts chapter 13, verse 45. He goes to the synagogue, first missionary journey, goes to teach. They don't like what he has to say. They try to, you know, verbally shut him down. Does it stop him? No. Why? He's not ashamed of the gospel. He knows it's the truth. Acts chapter 14, he goes to the city of Lystra. The Jews there don't like what he has to say about the Messiah, the anointed Messiah, Jesus. They stone him there. Does that stop him? No. He continues to travel and speak. Philippi, uh, they get mad at him because he delivers a demon out of a girl that uses her esoteric knowledge to make a money. And now all of a sudden she gets saved. No money. They try to get rid of Paul. That doesn't work. Uh, He winds up in in Greece on Mars Hill debating all the Stoics and the Epicureans, all the philosophers. And they're making fun of him and laughing at him as he's talking about the resurrection. But some of them believed because Paul didn't stop talking about the gospel. So he was not ashamed of it. Why are some Christians ashamed of the gospel? Because some of them are. 
And I think he put this in here to the Roman letter because some of the Romans might have been ashamed. And he says, if I come there, I'm just telling you, I'm the kind of guy, I'm not ashamed. But I, and I don't want you to be ashamed either. Here's some reasons why I think Christians would be ashamed. Number one, well, I, I certainly don't want anyone to think that I'm intolerant of other religious views. Uh, can we discuss truth? No, I don't want to come across that way. Uh, I don't want to come across as unloving and uncaring. If I take a definitive position, it will look unloving and uncaring. If you are, are you parents? Any parents with children? Do you take, do you take definitive positions with your children? <laughs> you have to, right? Do you love them? Yes. Same thing with the gospel. I don't want people to think that I'm arrogant because I think there's only one way to God. Uh, I don't want to come across at work as being narrow-minded and exclusive. Uh, I don't want to say something which might result in my friends not wanting to, excuse me for the 60s terminology, hang out with me anymore. Uh, I don't want to look weird. Or That's a 60s term. Uh, what would the term be today? You don't live in this culture? Yeah. Strange, bizarre, whatever, pick it. I don't want to come across that way, so I'm just going to lay low. Um, I definitely don't want to be ridiculed or criticized for the restrictive nature of the gospel. Yeah, I know it's restrictive. I just want to talk about it because I'm sure I'll take some heat for that. I'll just let other people do that. Ashamed. Again, I told you, you have two options if you're ashamed. You either don't know the Christ or you do know him and you need to move on to maturity because mature believers talk about the gospel. Why? Because it's preeminent. It's the gospel. Number two, I'll close with this. Second reason he wants to talk about the gospel, it's powerful. Notice what he says. For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Second reason, for it's the power of God. For what? Salvation. Salvation. For who? Well, just some people. No, everyone. Who does what? Well, believes in God and does a whole bunch of religious works. No. For everyone who believes. Who's that? Well, Jew first. The gospel came to the Jews first and then to the Greeks, which is everybody else. Interesting what he says here. He says the, the, that the gospel is power. Power. Um, remember the word we talked about last week? Thankfulness was eucharisteo. Sounds like eucharist, and it is. Uh, this word, I'll give you another Greek word, and you, you probably know, this, this, this is why it's easy to memorize Greek words. Um, this one is dunamis. Sound familiar? Power, dunamis, dynamo, dynamite, etc. So a lot of, a lot of uh, scholars and, and some pastors will, will look at that word and go, oh, it sounds like dynamite. That's what the gospel is. It is power. It can, can save a man. Nah. They start preaching like that, don't they? <laughs> you think, what happened to Marty? You know, like, I'm sorry, I'll be stilted and scholastic. You know, yes, sir. It's, uh, it's what you need. Could you? <laughs> I could preach like that, but I don't. But, but that, that's the way they talk, you know, and they, they talk about the, it's, it's just how many syllables are in power. They can stretch it out. The gospel is power. It's like dynamite. <laughs> No, no, that's not, that's not what he's talking about here. Well, how do I know? Because I took six, year, six years of Greek. So this is what is called root fallacy. This is taking a word and anachronistically reading what you believe about it today back into the word. That had nothing to do with that. This is a simple question. Did Paul know what the word dynamite meant? No, no. So we're reading back into the root. Root fallacy. Here's John MacArthur. Here's what he says about this verse. First of all, I'm quoting, Paul declares the gospel is the power of God, period. Okay, good. Then he says, dunamis, or power, is the Greek term from which we get our word dynamite. Mm, sorry, John. No, it's not. Um, where do you get that idea? Uh, I think he got it from Donald Barnhouse. It would be my conjecture. Back in 1952, because I know MacArthur reads Barnhouse. Um, here's what Barnhouse said. Back in 1952, it says the Greek language has eight different words for power, all translated by one English word, power. But here in our text, Barnhouse says, we have a word that is an unusual word. It is dunamis, uh, the word from which scientists have adopted for the term dynamo, dynamite, and dynamic. That's the power of the gospel. No, it's not. Because that's not what the word means. Dunamis means, and it is the word used to denote resurrection power. What does dynamite do? It blows stuff up. I mean, if you ever want to create something, do you use dynamite? Why would you logically relate the gospel to dynamite? No way. I, you relate it to resurrection power because Paul is more concerned about not dynamite, not that power. When he uses dynamite, it's in reference to the empty tomb. You want to talk about power? How do you res reverse necrosis? 
I mean, a circulatory a system that is shut down. I mean, a respiratory system that is shut down. A nervous system that is shut down. How do you take a dead body and bring it to life? Only God Almighty can do that. You talk about power? Now, what's that mean? That means that someone who's dead in sin like Hubie can be in a Datsun B210 with fogged up windows and be dead when he walks in the car and the power of God is unleashed at the moment of belief and he's a new man. That's power. There's nothing like it. Power. And it all happened at the moment of belief. What kind of belief? Well, you Christians, you don't have any evidence, so it's just blind faith. No, it's not. God created our minds. He helped us evaluate the evidences of the historicity of Christ, the, the death of Christ, verified by biblical, extra-biblical literature, Roman historians. Pick them. We are talked about these a couple of weeks ago. You believe in that evidence, you as a sinner, that he's the Savior who died, was buried, and rose again for you, you're saved at that amazing moment, but it takes belief in the evidence. Belief in the evidence. A little straight, biblical belief with me as a tree trimmer. <laughs> I was a tree trimmer before they had gear. I mean, before they had belts and hooks and all, I mean, all that stuff. When you just went up in the trees with a chainsaw, 40, 50 feet up and did your thing and just hope to God that you didn't fall. I mean... <laughs> I've been up there, and I'm not afraid of heights, and I, I don't get vertigo and motion sickness and that kind of stuff in trees that are moving with the wind. And so I've been up in many trees. So when I went to my first church in Arizona, <laughs> and I have a, a, a bunch of palm trees in my yard, uh, I want them squared away, so I want them all skinned. Because that's where you climb up the tree, take a knife, and you skin them with a utility blade, cut off all the husk of the tree, cut off all the fronds and everything. And so I'd never done this, but I thought, I've climbed a bunch of trees, how hard can this be? It's just one straight up. <laughs> it was about 60 feet. So I talked to a friend of mine, ran a golf course. I got his cleats, uh, put them on, strapped them on. Uh, he said, it's pretty simple. You just you know, dig them in, and here's the belt. And you wrap the leather belt around the tree. You lean backwards, create tension on the belt as you're going up with your cleats. Just don't, don't lean forward. <laughs> simple. I was 27, thought I couldn't die. I went up the tree, had the saw hanging off my belt, climbing up the tree. I got up about 50 feet. Wife's inside the house watching a TV show. Uh, I'm, in, I'm up about 50 feet. Uh, one of the cleats, uh, as I pulled it out, the right cleat, I got a, a cramp in my arch. Uh, and it was one of those really you know, hard cramps. So to, to deal with the cramp, I leaned forward. <laughs> it was brutal. You know, how do you break your fall in a palm tree? You know, I'd fallen in trees before and it hit branches, but there's nothing on a palm tree. So I just, I hugged it all the way down. Yeah. I know you're laughing at my pain. I get it. Next week we're talking about mercy and grace, but I had so many, I kid you not, this is not hyperbolic either. I had so many, I had so many splinters in my forearms. You could not see my forearms. I just let them go. Couldn't get them out. They didn't even go to the hospital. And on my way down this tree, as I'm being you know, beaten to death by the tree, my left cleat got stuck in the tree, and I was hanging there about 20 feet off the ground, hanging there by that rubber, that belt, you know? And I was calling for my wife <laughs> to come save me. And she said through the window, I'm watching a show. I'll be there in a minute. <laughs> you better get out of here. I'm going to be a dead husband hanging in this tree. She came out there and was like, what in the world? And she saved me. She got a ladder. Now, what's that got to do with the gospel and belief? Everything. Because think about it. You want to go to heaven, right? I do. It takes faith to go up. What kind of faith? Well, you got to do what God says to do. You got to believe in his gospel. He's the belt. He's the belt. I got to have faith that belt holds me up as I go up. It's that faith in that belt that redeems and saves and who knows what this is. <laughs> what in the world? That is not planned. Are those like angel wings or something? <laughs> Did you see that stuff falling from the ceiling? Now, in California, it'd be an earthquake, and we'd just all die for cover, but it's just the devil. He's trying to interrupt me. I mean, think about it. Faith that the belt... Jesus does what he says he's going to do. He's going to deliver me, right, as I go up. You have that kind of faith? Or do you trust in your own strength? You trust in your own strength, you're going down. Been there, done that. Faith leans back and trusts God to do what he does best. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the simplicity of faith, for the wonder of faith, 
uh, that it's based upon the evidences that we find in many places if we are careful enough to consider. And we thank you for Paul, a Jew who came to know you as Savior. Thank you for redeeming him, saving him, and for him being such a great bold witness for you. We, we get his passion even 2,000 years later. May we use that passion to lead many in our family and friends to Christ.